opportunity to be here today and speak uh, a little bit about the president's agenda. Obviously, um, as Scott mentioned, uh, back in the in my House and Senate days, I had the great opportunity to attend this event, and I feel like every year it goes larger and larger, and it's uh, it's great to be here and, and to be part of it. In some ways, I think it's fair to say that this event is timelier than ever. I say that because at this moment in time, Americans are acutely aware of our country's energy challenges, and they're seeing how those challenges impact them and their pocketbooks. So they're paying close attention to these issues. And one issue that's weighed heavily on the minds of many American families and business owners over the past few months is the rising cost of gasoline. Even as the average price of, uh, of gallon gasoline has fallen over the past few weeks, consumers are still feeling the pain of the pump. For Americans already struggling to make ends meet, high gas prices put an extra strain on tight household budgets, especially when you consider that transportation is already one of the largest expenses for many American families, typically second only to housing. And every time the price of a barrel of oil rises by $10, a gallon of gas goes up by about 25 cents. So the president certainly understands the impact of high gas prices, both in terms of what it means for individual families and for our economy as a whole. But the hard truth is that there are no quick fixes to rising gas prices. The recent events we've seen are driven by the unrest in North Africa and the Middle East, as well as growing global demand, namely from emerging economies around the world. We've got countries like India and China that are growing at rapid clip, and as two billion more people start consuming more goods, driving more cars, and using more oil, demand is going to outpace supply in the future. That much is certain. Recently, news was made when we learned that China has overtaken the United States as the world's largest consumer of energy. That headline is even more impressive when you consider that only about a decade ago, China's energy consumption was half that of the United States. Half. So they are experiencing an explosive growth. In 2010 alone, China's energy consumption rose by an impressive 11.2%, compared with 3.7% in the United States. In fact, China's growth resulted in a 5.6% increase in global energy demand, biggest one-year jump since 1973. I want to reiterate that there are no overnight solutions, but that's why from the very beginning, the administration has been focused on charting a new course on energy and pursuing a comprehensive strategy that will create a more secure energy future for the United States. When the President was elected in office, we imported 11 million barrels of oil a day. The President has set a bold and achievable goal to reduce those imports by a third in 2025. To achieve that goal, we're focused on the following three areas. One, expanding domestic oil and gas production. Two, promoting energy efficiency. And three, developing and deploying the next generation of clean alternative fuels. Even as we develop next generation energy technologies, we'll continue to rely on oil and gas in the years ahead. And despite all the rhetoric when it comes to expanding the domestic production of these resources, the administration has made significant progress. Last year, U.S. crude production reached its highest level since 2003. And the President recently announced additional steps that will increase onshore and offshore oil and gas development as long as it's done safely and responsibly. Now, you've heard the President say that even if we increase domestic oil production, that's not going to be the long-term solution to our energy challenges. We consume about 25% of the world's oil. We only have 2% of the reserves. Math doesn't add up. That's why we're focused on energy efficiency, which we know is one of the fastest, easiest, and cheapest ways for the United States to reduce its dependence on oil, save consumers money, and curb pollution. When it comes to the transportation sector, increasing the fuel efficiency of our cars and trucks can go a long way towards breaking our dependence on oil. And that's because the oil used for transportation accounts for over 70% of total oil consumption in the United States today. One of the first actions taken by President Obama was to direct the EPA and the Department of Transportation to work together on a problem. By partnering with the automotive industry and key states, we reached an historic agreement to set the toughest fuel efficiency standards ever for model year 2012 to 2016 cars and light duty trucks. This program will save over 1.8 billion barrels of oil over the life of the program and the average consumer $3,000. By the way, these new fuel efficiency standards have also proven valuable to the auto industry. After three decades of inaction and resistance to higher standards, many companies are now seeing the benefits. 
Case in point, this past April, Ford reported its largest first quarter profit since 1998 as sales shifted to smaller and more efficient vehicles. To build on this product, progress, next month, the administration plans to finalize the first ever national fuel economy standards for heavy duty trucks. We're also developing the next round of fuel efficiency standards for all year 2017 and 2025 cars, which result in significant oil savings for the nation and fuel savings for the American consumer. As an aside to tackling our addiction to oil, since we're talking about efficiency, I wanted to talk a little bit about increasing the energy efficiency of our homes and businesses, which can reduce pollution, create jobs, and lower electricity bills for American families. It's a win-win proposition. What's great about efficiency for the built environment is that we already have the technology. For the most part, we don't necessarily need to create something new. The biggest challenge is that in order to install the insulation, the energy efficient windows, the energy efficient lighting, you need to make an investment up front. For a lot of families and business owners, that's not always an option. So the administration has been focused on putting the right incentives in place to make these types of efficiency upgrades within reach. And we're making progress. Under the Recovery Act, we made critical investments that have already led to the weatherization of over 350,000 homes across the country. And through the President's Better Building Initiative, we're taking steps to leverage private sector investment to make commercial buildings 20% more efficient by 2040. This program has the potential to create a tremendous impact in the years ahead. Upgrading the efficiency of our buildings could save American businesses up to $40 billion a year on the utility bill. So getting back to our oil savings agenda and that third bucket, which is uh, inventing an alternative to oil, the administration has done a lot to pursue advanced biofuels. To date, our administration has provided over $800 million to support biofuels research and development and accelerate the commercialization of these technologies. We also provided $400 million to fund DOE's advanced research project energy uh, agency ARPA-E. ARPA-E focuses on creative, out-of-the-box, transformational energy research for success would have dramatic benefits for the nation. They are working on a number of cutting-edge technologies and projects that involve creating fuels directly from sunlight and finding more efficient ways to produce energy from biomass. In addition to the cutting-edge R&D that's taking place in our national labs, we're seeing more and more exciting progress from the private sector as well. In New Mexico, they're pioneering innovative new ways to commercialize LG-based biofuels. There's another company in Montana recently met with that's growing advanced Camelina-based biofuels to power military jets that literally fly faster than the speed of sound. These success stories are made possible in part because the investments this administration has made over the last two years. Now, as we do develop cleaner sources of fuel, we will also need cleaner sources of electricity. That's the other half of the energy equation. To accomplish that goal, the President has proposed a clean energy standard. Under the President's plan, we would double the percentage of electricity that comes from clean energy sources by 2035. Part of what makes the clean energy standard attractive is that it doesn't pay for energy users. Instead, to provide flexibility in meeting the ultimate target with all sources of clean energy, from renewables like wind and solar to efficient natural gas and coal with carbon capture and sequestration, would all count towards the goal. A clean energy standard would also expand the scope of clean energy investments because it provides companies with the certainty they need to move capital off the sidelines and into the clean energy economy. By setting very clear long term goals, we require utilities to increase the share of clean energy sources in their portfolio over time. We'll see more and more investors willing to make big capital investments in advanced energy technologies, including many of the technologies on display in this room today. I want to stress that all of the administration's efforts to create a 21st century clean energy economy is directly connected to our economic competitiveness in the long haul. History shows us that we have to get serious about those efforts now. Think about this. In the 1980s, America was home to more than 80% of the world's wind capacity, 90% of the world's solar capacity. We were the leaders in wind, we were the leaders in solar. Today, China has the most wind capacity. Germany has the most solar capacity. Both invest in more in clean energy than we do, even though we are a larger economy. We've fallen behind what is going to be one of the keys for our long-term competitiveness, and the longer we wait, the higher the price for a nation. 
We all understand that we've got a tight fiscal situation right now, so it's fair to ask how it takes government's investment in energy. And as we favor our national priorities and the budget choices in Congress, we're going to have to make some tough choices. But as the President has said, it doesn't make sense to have a in energy. After all, these investments can lead to game-changing breakthroughs. Over at the Department of Energy, there's a great program called the Sunshot Initiative. The goal of that program is to reduce the cost of solar energy by 75% before year 2020. <coughs> so it's no small challenge. But reaching that goal will really transform the industry. It would help accelerate the deployment of solar energy across the country. It would create jobs. It would save consumers money. And it would reduce pollution. It's a perfect example of why the president believes that even as we tighten our belts in some areas, investment in clean energy research and development will be critical to meeting our energy challenges and staying economically competitive in the future. And moving forward, we're going to fight to protect those investments. Thank you.